Well, we are going to get started. So my name is Danny Fry, and I am the Director of Student and Civic Engagement. Does anyone have any idea what I do for a living? It's fun, just guess. Where are my people who always hit their word limit with papers? Even just rearrange that title of the new words, right? Student and Civic Engagement. No guesses? Okay, so I will explain. Oh, go ahead. You're right. You um, organize the kids' volunteer and any activities on campus. Pretty much, yeah. That was actually a really good, good job. So, yeah. So, my job um, is, is kind of all over the place, is the truth. But if I simply put it this way, I am one, somewhat responsible for your student having healthy fun. <laughs> Two, I am mostly responsible for the out of classroom experience at Penn State. And I'm not the only person who, who um, dabbles in that space, but that is prob probably more than any other office. Our office is responsible for that. And then the other piece is that we are absolutely educators. So the idea of the philosophy of my office is that we are helping your student learn in non traditional ways because life teaches us a lot of things that we don't learn from books, would you agree? Right. And so why I'm starting off with a quick explanation of my job is partially because I need your help. While I consider myself an educator, I am not a faculty member. It is not part of my daily life that I stare to see of faces who look like they couldn't be less interested in what I'm saying, right? I don't know how faculty members do that sometimes. The other piece is I can see every one of you. And I like to tell you all that because I need you to nod with me sometimes. Okay, I need affirmation. I'm a human. So if I say something that makes sense, nod. If I say something that doesn't make sense, can you ask me what I mean and ask me the chance to clarify it? If I say something that bounces you three steps down the road and you have a burning question, let's just talk about it, okay? My biggest fear is that you'll walk away from our time together feeling like I wasted your time. So is that fair expectations for all of us? Okay. So I told you my fear, but my other, my goal for today's presentation is to start getting you to think differently about what it means to support your student. Because I recognize that before today, you were thinking about getting your student into school, yes. Then picking which school are they going to. Yes. Then their major, if you didn't already know that. And then how are they, how are you paying for it, right? Up until today, that's where most of your focus has been. You probably also are worrying about some other logistical things like, Who's their roommate going to be? Where are they living? All those things. But overarchingly, you probably weren't thinking about the day-to-day -day experience your student is about to have. And so this presentation is informed with over 100 years of student affairs experience to share with you what we think would help your student be successful in this space. Is that good base level ground rules? Yes. Wonderful. Some of you are paying attention and giving me affirmation. Who's over here? Thank you, whoever that was. Okay. So I'm sure I'm not the first person to say, but welcome to Penn State Altoona. Folks, we are excited to have you. After graduation in May, we have like two weeks where we really save the quiet, right? We're also trying to clean up the piles of stuff on our desk, right? And then we start getting ready for you all, and it re-energizes us because at the end of the day, we love supporting and working with your students. So we are excited that you're here. I also like to say thank you. The fact that you are sitting in this room today represents an investment in what you believe your student's future could be. And I I know it also represents some sacrifice. How many of you used a vacation day to be here today? Okay. How many of you in your boss thinks you're actually at work? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you had to get a hotel room to come? Maybe one or two nights even. Great. How many of you simply just wish you had more time? Yeah. Right. That's called everybody. I'm going to start a club. I will be president, then I'll have less time. No, just kidding. Um, so we do want to say thank you because the fact of the matter is if you weren't sitting here today, your student could still graduate. Right? That wouldn't stop them. But you clearly think that there's more that you could learn to support your students. So that's what we're here and we're here, here to talk about. And I just want to honor that because that's important. I do want to talk a little bit about what student affairs is. So you heard me say over 100 years of student affairs went into experience, went into informing this presentation. But I also want to point out what student affairs actually means because maybe you didn't have a college experience and that this is new to you. Or maybe when you went to school, things were very different. You know, years and years and years ago, the faculty did all of this. They taught classes and did the out of classroom stuff. As student needs changed, as research got more intensive, as all sorts of, as the world changed, we shifted into two different industries effectively. And so I do want to explain what we do. So I, I represent student affairs today. In graphic form, this is what we stand for. We are going to support your student while challenging them in the effort to get them to grow. 
if your student is the same person as they are today when they leave Penn State Altoona, and I don't care if that's two years from now, four years, five, if they were like me and did the victory lap, anyone else? <laughs> victory lap, folks, no? Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think that's called emotional framing. I'm just re, re, restructuring that, right? It makes me feel a little bit better. If you won't talk about the student debt that I got in that fifth year, but anyway. Um, so our goal is for them to grow. If they don't walk into this experience wanting to grow, I would argue that they maybe don't fully understand what higher ed stands for, which we will talk about quite a bit in this presentation. But we are functionally comprised of several different offices. The first is residence life. How many of your students will be living in our residence hall? So on campus in the four halls. Wonderful. Okay. And you know that they got the roommate assignments and roommate and room assignments. Wonderful. Good job. Um, so all summer up until this week, people were like, when do we find out? So I've been telling them. Now I get to say, you should know. And that's good. Um, so our residence life team is comprised of um, four full-time professionals, all of whom have their master's degrees. Likely in something like student affairs, um, student personnel management, counseling, something like that. They are full blown professional folks who live alongside your students in the halls. We have a team of about 25 students who are trained extensively on things like mental health first aid, conflict management, diversity and inclusion, and also things like, hey, people need to wash their sheets on a semi-regular basis, and you can help them and remind them on those things, okay? And these are students, so they're their peers, because let's be real, sometimes messages land a lot better when they're coming from someone that you feel is in the same boat as you. So those students are there to set up that learning and learning environment. We have about 1,000 students that live in the halls, just shy of 1,000. And so your students that will be living there will be one of them. The other piece is off-campus student living, and that's Twofold. So the first is those students who will be living with you and commuting in and out each day. Where are those folks? Okay, just a couple today. Okay, that's typically closer to anywhere from a third to a quarter of our student population. So don't let today's numbers fool you. We have about that's many of our students. So we try to do outreach to those students because I will tell you one of the things that makes me saddest is when I hear stories of students that live in Holidaysburg, which is about a 20 minute drive one way, and they will come to class for an hour and they have an hour break. They will drive home and drive back in that hour break, mostly because they don't know where else to go. I've also heard stories of students commuting who will sit in their cars with blankets because it's central PA, it'll snow next week, right? And they'll watch movies in their car. And when I hear them, like, you know the buildings are heated, right? Just come in, take a seat. This building that's not being used for presentations is just an open space that students can hang out in. These chairs are slept in quite a bit. We also would wash them quite a bit. So just so you know, as you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, like let's tell, like we want students and the commuters to understand that this campus is their campus too, regardless of the fact that they don't sleep here, right? At least overnight, they might sleep in this building, but you get my point. So we do outreach to those students. We try to connect them to each other as well. Otherwise, we have students who live off campus in rented facilities. Where are those folks? And not in, in, in non university owned housing. Okay, great. And so there's quite a few of those. That's probably our biggest grouping is the truth. Um, there's several thousand, or not several thousand, there's probably about 2,000 students that live off campus, but usually within walking distance of campus. Um, so for those students, comparably to the commuters, we try to convince them to stick around sometimes because we are fighting human nature. Raise your hands that if you, when you go home at night, if you sit down, your productivity is done. Right? I shared the other night, I literally sat down on my couch, I have two toddlers, and they're like, mommy, cuddle with me, which, duh, of course, I'm going to cuddle with them. And then I stared at three baskets of laundry because they needed folded, and they were right there, but I was comfy, right? Like, human nature does that to us. It happens just the same when they walk up the hill to Nittany Point. Have you looked at that hill yet? Yeah. It can be a nice workout, right, <laughs> depending on how you approach that. So students will go up after class, and then they don't want to come back down, right? And I get it, so I try to convince them to stick around. We do take educational programming to them, usually around things like bystander intervention, mental health, stress management, decisions related to substances, trying to do some trainings and educational outreach. Most of this, I'm sorry, the social programming those stays on campus, so we try to bring them back for that. I want to point those things out because I need you to understand that I don't care where your student lives. I have been fighting a misconception every year that I've worked here and have not won yet that it does not matter where your student lives. If student affairs is doing something, or athletics, or whatever it is, if it's advertised to students, it is open to all students. One tiny exception, and that is the residence halls. You have to be a guest of someone who lives in the residence halls to be in that space. Even, even myself, as a member of student affairs, the staff, I can't walk into the residence halls. And I feel like for those of you that have your students in the residence halls, you're probably happy to hear that. 
right? Because it's a private residence hall. And so there shouldn't be people in there who don't live there who aren't escorted by someone who does live in there. If it's not in a residence hall, your student is invited. Are we clear on that, please? Help me fight that fight, right? <laughs> your student is always invited. And so those are three, those are two of the areas of student affairs. Another place is student conduct. And student conduct philosophically basically rests on the idea that humans sometimes make bad decisions, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's who they are as a person, right? How many of you have made a decision that you have regretted in the last month? Right? Any speeding tickets? That's been my example lately, right? Because that one's relatively innocent. People are willing to usually admit to that, right? Right. My bad decision was not pulling the three baskets of laundry the other day. I know better. I regretted it the next day immediately, right? We make that bad decisions all the time all the time because we're people and usually we know that it was a bad decision as soon as we made it is that a fair statement yeah we typically see the students that enter into our student conduct world are usually just a one time they're in they're out they're like yep i won't make that decision again jennifer uh, dr jennifer sabrin who is the director of student conduct she typically talks about help me understand what led you to make this decision so with that student she's walking them through logic and reasoning and also the thought process of did that just Decision get you any closer to what you want to what you want to be, what you want to be known for, what you want to do with your life, and that usually is enough. We absolutely have some frequent flyers. Dr. Saberin is cool. I just have to believe the students like hanging out with her, right? And so there might be a little bit different conversations that get tougher there. And once in a while, it's not frequent, but once in a while, we have a student that we just say, you know what, we are clearly not the right place for you at this time. And then, and maybe when you're ready, we can revisit this conversation and you can come back. I say that because I think typically people have the wrong impression about what our goal is about conduct. We really want students to learn, right? We want them to understand that they can move on from mistakes. Raise your hand if there are moments in your life that do not, that you made decisions that do not represent who you are now today, right? Folks, if I could show you a highlight reel, and I'm saying that with a little bit of sarcasm for my undergraduate career, you'd be shocked sometimes that this is my profession. Right? I am a different person than I was 10, 15 years ago, and that's a good thing. And so we believe that about your student too. But we also believe that there are rules that we need to enforce. How many of you are Penn State graduates? Keep your hands up for a second for me. Have you bragged about being a Penn State graduate? Thank you for your honesty. Integrity is one of our values. That's important if you were listening. Good. If you are not a Penn State graduate, how many of you have had someone brag to you about being a Penn State graduate? That's everybody else, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we have a little bit of an arrogance about us, folks. But if we're gonna have that arrogance, we better walk the talk, would you agree? Right? We better represent what this institution represents. We better understand the importance of growth education impacting our world in positive ways. And so we, the conduct office also enforces that. Um, the student uh, code of conduct is online if you're curious about what they enforce. I will tell you, I'm sure most of you are thinking about alcohol, which absolutely is one of the, the things we've addressed the most in conduct. We also address illegal downloading of things on Penn State servers, right? Like it's, it's all over the place of what can be considered conduct. Your student is responsible for knowing what's in there. It's not like, it's just like if you're in a different state and you're like, oh, I didn't know the speed limit. Doesn't matter, you still broke the rule. And so it's kind of the same thing. So I just wanna point that out for you all today. Conduct also addresses things related to Title IX legislation. Are you familiar with Title IX? If you are not, I would really encourage you to Google that. Title IX is um, federal legislation that ensures equity of access to education in a collegiate environment. Years ago, it was mostly just applied in athletic space, but in the past decade or so, we've really seen a revisit to that legislation. And there's a lot of conversations about campus safety, about dating violence, all those types of things. Does this sound more familiar now? So we do a lot of education and outreach related to Title IX. And then we also do bystander intervention, which I will circle back to later. But that's student conduct. We have international student services. This year, your students cohort will have 140 new international students joining us. Um, last year, it was about 50 different countries from all over the world. We're really proud of that because we think that's an, a crucial part of the learning experience, that your student understands they are a member of our global environment, and we can learn from each other. And conversely, those international students want to learn from our domestic students. And so uh, we do a lot of programming trying to integrate, learn about different cultures, hear about current events in different countries, things like that. We also have, um, I'm going to talk about three different departments that fall in one building. So it's our health and wellness center. We have health services, which is more of a medical arm. We have counseling and psychological services. And then we also have disability services. So I'll talk about them briefly. But the idea is that we are an integrated model. And we are accredited. Do any of you work in the medical field? 
right? So if you, you know accreditation is quite a process, lots of hoops to jump through, but we're proud of that because we have done the work to make sure that we are providing the best care for our students. So your student, regardless of where they live, right? We already talked about that. I'm just gonna keep reinforcing it. Say they're here and they need, they need medicine. They have a sinus infection. They present to the Health and Wellness Center. First of all, we will medically bill your insurance for those services. So a quick tidbit, if they are on your insurance, please don't assume they know your full birthday. <laughs> uh, I, that's not meant to be insulting. It's not meant to be anything more than we see students all the time. They're filling out that paperwork and they pick up their phone, mom, what's your birthday? Right, which is an awkward conversation. So maybe just like slide them a little piece of paper to avoid that awkward moment, right? They might, they probably know the day and the month, but likely not the year. Um, but we will medically bill for that. While they are getting treated for their sinus infection, they are also going to have some screenings related to their mental health, to their substance decisions, to their relationship decisions, et cetera. That screening is meant to be a tool and a conversation starter. The student raises some red flags. Our medical professionals are trained in working with college students. And they will say to them, so tell me about how you're spending your time. Tell me about your stress levels. Can we help you in some way? Because sometimes people don't know what they don't know. Students might be throwing up a red flag that professionals recognize as, hey, you might need some support here, but the students might just think they're tired, right? And I'm partially saying that because I was that student. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight and training and wisdom that comes with life, I should have been asking for help as an undergraduate student. I used to nap for like four hours a day, folks. Does anyone else hide from their problems by napping? Because I did. Right now, I just read books. <laughs> That's my new hiding mechanism, if I'm being very honest. But looking back, I just wonder how much easier college would have been if I had just had the courage to ask for the help I needed. Right? And we have learned so much since even when I was an undergrad that we really employed those ideas. And so if a student flags and says, you know what, I do, in fact, I would really like some counseling services. We offer six free counseling sessions per academic year that they're at Penn State Altoona. If a student would need more than that, we do not insurance bill. We have learned that students were still working to overcome mental health stigmas, that mental health, the need for mental health support does not represent a weakness. And so our, our, health, our, our health and wellness staff will work with your student to figure out what the next steps are beyond those six sessions if they're needed. That makes sense so far. Okay. Any questions about that? The next piece of health and wellness is disability services, which likely you already know some of this information, but I'm just going to repeat it quickly in case. But if your student has an IEP, but they need some type of accommodations to be successful in the classroom. We have a wonderful, wonderful professional named Mandy Roman, who is waiting to support your student. There is a difference though in college versus high school that your student needs to disclose that paperwork themselves. You can't do it for them. If they have that paperwork today, they can go see Mandy, she's here. Um, but otherwise, they can turn that paperwork in at any time. Now, we recommend thinking about timing because sometimes we'll see students who turn in accommodation, the need for accommodation paperwork in week 14 of the semester. The next week is the last week of classes. She's not a magician, right? Like she can't pull that off that quickly. But if she gets it today, for example, she can be working with their faculty before classes even start to make sure your student is supported appropriately. So if you have specific questions, I can do my best after. I'll stay after for questions. I will do my best to help you, but mostly that conversation is going to end with, let's go see Mandy, because she's the professional in that space. So that's our Health and Wellness Center. We also have diversity and inclusion programming. Parallel to International Student Services, we want your student to understand that while they are unique and their perspective is important and their lived experience is true and we should honor that, it's not the only one that matters. One of the things our diversity and inclusion um, professional does is to do conflict management training and training on how to have civil conversations in spaces that usually people want to yell at each other, right? And part of this comes out of the need for avoiding comment sections. How many of you stopped reading comments on the internet? Right? I think there, me too, to be fair, no judgment there because that's not good for my soul to do that all the time, right? But one of the things that we know is that people forget there are people on the other side of those opinions, right? And so what we want is for students to look each other in the eye and understand they can disagree and two differing, uh, differing opinions can exist in the same space and it doesn't necessarily make either of them wrong, right? Or it might mean, hey, we need to each do the work on our own lives to help understand other folks. Power and privilege is a real thing, we need to understand that. 
And so for your student to be successful to live out those Penn State values, we want to expose them to these ideas. The last piece is student and civic engagement, which is my world. I already talked a little bit about student engagement and the idea that there's a lot of learning to be had outside of the classroom. But I will quickly just mention about civic engagement. How many of you are taxpayers in Pennsylvania? What about taxpayers in the United States? Yeah, I want to call attention to that. First of all, to say thank you. Truly, your tax dollars help fund this enterprise and they are crucial. We truly rely on your tax dollars. But we also believe we owe you a return on that investment. And first of all, of course, that's mean we put out good professionals in this world. You know, good accountants, good engineers, good nurses, good teachers, all the things, right? But we also believe they need to be good neighbors. That they need to pick up litter when they see it. That they need to check on the elderly neighbor down the street whenever bad winter storms come in. That they might need to consider running for mayor of their town. That they might need to serve on school boards or nonprofit boards. Do any of you do those things? You serve on nonprofit boards in your community or things like that? Yeah. How many of you work in human services? Right? That maybe you report to a board. Okay. Interesting. From a statistics standpoint, that is not normal for my numbers. I know I get a lot more hands than that. But if you're familiar with that your community works, there are an incredible amount of volunteers that keep it running. Um, we talk a lot with our students about the idea of time, talent, or treasure. Have you heard of those concepts? The idea is, is that someone can donate one of those things, whether it's their time, you know, good old-fashioned old -fashioned sweat equity, right? Or maybe it's their talent. For our students, I truly, when I say we send our students sometimes to nursing homes to teach people how to use Facebook, right? Because they understand how to do that, or build websites, or whatever it is or treasure, and that's more the financial means, right? Or, or the um, maybe capital in other ways. And so our, we want our students to understand they can help others. They can just choose how they want to help others. And so that's that civic engagement piece. And we're really passionate about that at Penn State. So all of that is student affairs, but now I want to transition to your student and what's happening with your student. And bear with me, this is going to be simple, but just walk through it. Your student is leaving an environment where they have to ask to go to the bathroom, yes? If they're late for homeroom, you get an email or a text message about it. Yes. Yeah, that wasn't a thing when I was in high school. I could learn that that's a thing now, right? If they did badly on a test, you knew probably before they came home, depending on the nature of that test. I've been hearing that more and more as well. And so they come from that environment. Where they come here, they were, today they are getting a 15 credit course schedule, likely that's the majority of our students. Which how many of you are anxiously waiting seeing that course schedule? Yeah, folks, I know, right? <laughs> I know that's what you're here for. That and the ID, that's what those, the, the highlights of today. That that's what folks think. Um, but they are getting that 15 court week or 15 credit course schedule, which means they will spend, they should spend, I should be clear, they should spend 15 hours a week in a formal classroom setting. The adage is for every hour that you spend in class, you're supposed to study for two hours. So ideally, they would be spending 45 hours a week on academics. I don't want to paint too broadly of a brush here, folks, but I don't see students necessarily studying that much, especially in their first year. How many of you study two hours for every hour you spent in class? Yeah, good for you. That's amazing. I love that. You are probably way more disciplined than I am in this moment, right? Especially first year students. We definitely see that closer to like junior and senior year. Absolutely. When they understand, them, you know, there's maturity that kicks in and they recognize maybe some of the mistakes they made. But the the vast majority of our students are going to try to continue operating like they did in, in high school, which is probably not reading the way they should read. I've had students tell me that they never read a single book in high school, right? And they come here and they get in between two days of classes, an assignment to read six chapters for one class. And then they're confused about why they're behind by week four because they never read the textbook, right? There's an incredible amount of change. Our faculty each have something called academic freedom and how they manage their classrooms. One way this plays out is each one of their five faculty members manages their classroom however they feel fit. Some faculty will say, if you come to class, I will honor that and I will teach you because I know that you care. If you don't come to class, so be it. I will continue doing my job anyway. Right? There are many of our faculty who never once will take attendance, not once. Then there are other faculty who will mark if your student is two minutes late and it will affect their end of the year grade. Right? Which on the quick note of skipping class, please tell your student to picture themselves burning $175 every time they skip class. I used to say it was 100 and a couple weeks ago, one of the, the parents in this cohort said, Danny, I actually did the numbers, it's 175 an hour now. Great, <laughs> wonderful. That might put it in a little bit of a different sense for them about what skipping class truly means. 
right? Because some students figure out quickly that it doesn't matter if they skip. I would like to ask them how things look at the end of their first semester, but you know. So we tell the students that in this frequent change, they have a lot of choices, but those choices all matter, right? We're not even talking about the social aspect, I'm just paying attention to the academic aspect. They're going to have to learn a whole new rhythm of life that typically doesn't even start settling until about week six of the semester. Fast forward, we throw finals week at them, blow all nighters for many of your students, right? That was my experience on days. You know, some night owls in the room, yeah. I always wonder why we haven't taken over the world while everybody else is sleeping, but anyway, or why we haven't shifted the world to be more on our clock. I have read lots of things about like super geniuses and history being night owls. I think there's a sign there, but anyway. Um, and so they're in that space of finals week, which is difficult. They'll come home for winter break, likely where they will nap a lot. And then we bring them back and say, here's a new course schedule, figure it out all over again, right? With new faculty, new expectations in the classroom, et cetera. We will do this at least eight times to them and expect them to do all of it flawlessly. I don't know about you, but I have a learning curve with change. I already have my 2020 planner and I'm planning diligently about what my, my spring semester looks like. Does anyone else like that? Paper planners all the way, yeah. <laughs> and so there's an incredible amount of frequent change. They're supposed to be exploring life, right? Higher education is meant to be an exploration of interests and passions. And while we love the students who absolutely know what they wanna do with, with their lives, how many of you, that's your student? Right? They know, this is what I want to do, this is my plan. That's amazing, and I admired that so much, truly. I talked to a student one time, he said, I wanted to be an electrical engineer when I was five. Folks, I didn't know those words when I was five, right? let alone what I wanted to do with my life. And I also know that today, I stand before you not fully sure what I want to be when I grow up. Anyone else? Right? And I point that out, folks, because sometimes we have these unrealistic expectations of students that at 18, the vast majority of our students are 18, that at 18, a student can understand their whole entire life plan before them. And I don't know about you, but my life has been taking lots of unexpected turns already. And so I feel like what I want to get through to students is that it's okay to explore because your life isn't going to be linear. Conversely, maybe you are absolutely sure you want to be a doctor. That's amazing. You can also minor in dance, right? Maybe you are absolutely sure you want to go into finance, but you really love English literature. Take the classes. Penn State is really cool that once you are paid, you're paying for 12 credits, which that's considered full time in undergraduate education. But just to be clear, if a student only takes 12 credits per semester, they will not graduate on time. They can't, they're not taking enough credit hours. So your student always needs to be in like the 15 credit space if they want to graduate on time. Um, just a quick note there with our academic planning. Um, but what we want students to do is to understand that they can be prepared for wherever life takes them. That higher education is not necessarily about vocation. Maybe they have a major that aligns perfectly with the job title, that's great, but most of our students won't necessarily do that, and that's okay. Um, current data is showing that for the millennial cohort, which is not your students, your students are Generation Z, but the millennial cohort is changing jobs and industries two and three times by the time they're 30 folks. That means they need to be able to pivot, and that means that they need to explore while they're here. We also want to talk about adulting. So for especially for the 18-year-olds or the 19-year-olds, we'll say young adults, they are legally adults, right? Practically, from my perspective, I'm not sure how many of them have actually had to be adults. And what I mean by that is you can raise your hand, challenge by choice, folks, I'm not going to call anyone out, but I am certain there is someone in this room, at least one, probably more, who they wake their student up every single day to get them to where they need to go on time. You don't have to raise your hand. I've given this, this presentation to, I think, over 8,000 people at this point. There's always at least one, right, in the, in the audience. Okay, so you don't want to admit to that, that's fine. There's absolutely someone who has always done their student's laundry in this space. Does anyone want to admit to that? Yeah, no, a couple. If you're at the front and you're, you're thinking, yes, I assure you there are people behind you giving me very slight, subtle nods, okay? I'm not picking on anyone, truly, and no judgment, but I do know that once they get here, unless they have the financial means to pay the very lucrative business, right, next door in Ivy Side Plaza to do their laundry, they need to know how to do their laundry. Folks, when I was a resident assistant in undergrad, I absolutely had to show one of my friends which one was the washer and which one was the dryer. I've heard stories of students using only fabric softener for a whole semester before they're getting someone figured out, your clothes aren't clean, they smell great, they're not clean, <laughs> right? We absolutely see students sometimes walking around with a slight pink hue to everything they wear because they misunderstood the whole separating thing, right? 
And I'm using that as an example to be the, the, just to point out the fact that likely you have very much helped manage their lives until this point. And again, no judgment, but if they are living away from you, they need to figure that out starting today. Laundry boot camp starts today. Alarm clock setting sets, starts today because no one else is going to do that for them. And I'm pointing that out because we realize that some families have some maybe off expectations about what college administrators do. My example for this is I had a father walk into my boss's office. My boss is effectively the dean of students. So he's got a really big job and a very important job. He is busy all the time. He's pretty much always running from one meeting to another, okay? A father walked into his office one time and said, excuse me, who will bring my son his nine o'clock snack? <laughs> Any guesses to what my boss said? <laughs> right, not him. I had a father a couple weeks ago said, did he say Danny would do it? <laughs> all right, no, we pointed out sheets, 24 seven folks, right? They have a, offer all sorts of things. We point that out because we see students stumble because they're used to a certain rhythm before they get here. And when they get here, those little changes become stressors, right? Because you have to learn how to time manage around laundry, right? You have to learn how to make sure that you have the clothes ready for the next day. You have to make sure that you are budgeting appropriately. Folks, I have never seen students eat out at restaurants like I do at Penn State out to that. I, I worked at other colleges. It's unbelievable to me. And by the way, freshman 15 is a very real thing if you're eating out at restaurants every single day. And that Uber Eats and DoorDash and all that stuff came in. They don't need to leave their room to get that food, right? So there's even less walking. The family that owns Great China, they are wonderful and great supports of our students. And they have absolutely told me that they see phone numbers and they know what the order is before they even pick up, <laughs> right? So you likely, I would advise that you have some conversations with your students about what budgeting means. You might think it's obvious to have X amount per semester, but do they really know what that means per day? And do they know what happens if they run out, right? Because I know that I have literally watched students call their moms and say, hey, sorry, I ran out of money again as they're holding Starbucks for the third time now, right? Like you might need to have some conversations about your expectations of what happens. What happens if they break their cell phone for the third time in an academic year or those types of things? Or if your student is commuting, what happens if they don't ration their gas money or, or whatever that is, right? None of my business, but please have conversations about with your student about budgeting. Or maybe the answer is curfew. And I'm bringing this one up because this was a story from my life. I already mentioned I was a night owl. It was very, very normal for me in undergrad to start a paper at 3 a.m. that was due at 8 a.m. Don't panic. I stand before you with a master's degree. I was a little bit of a slow learner, but I figured it out, okay? And so I would get up, of course, because this is rational, right? At 3 a.m., I would first go to Sheets because I needed caffeine and fried food to keep, take me through the all-nighter. And so I, when I, my fifth year, when I um, did my victory lap, I ended up moving back home with my parents and commuting for cost savings. And I would continue operating like that until my mother woke up one night and found me not at home. The next morning, we had a conversation that started like this. Well, when you live under my roof, you are not going to do that anymore. Or you at least have to tell me, right? How many of you have said that to your student? When you live under my roof, right? I'm pointing this out. Again, I don't care what your rules are for your student around curfew, but I'm willing to bet that if your student is living away from you, they are going to assume whatever the curfew that was that was in place no longer applies. Or if they're commuting, they're going to assume, hey, I don't have the chores I used to have. I don't have the curfew I used to have, et cetera, because now I'm in college. And now I can do whatever I want. Right? And so my advice is to talk to your student about that. We have a packet in the back of the student affairs table. We're in it are talking topics that we are just giving you suggestions of things that you shouldn't assume your student and you are on the same page about. And again, the goal is just to avoid some of those stressors. We literally teach students how to tie ties, how to sew on buttons. We have walked students through what it means to set up online banking on their phone. Ginny, who works in my office, teaches students how to write checks on a normal basis. So those adulting things that you might take for granted that they know, maybe for the next few weeks, every time you do something like that, you say to your student, hey, do you know how to do this? Hey, do you know what a unit price is at the grocery store? Right? Those things, because if they're going to be responsible for buying their own groceries, they might not know that. And so again, it's just that adulting piece. With this comes practicing decision making, independence, and having autonomy. I read a tweet a few weeks ago where a young woman who had graduated from another university was giving a shout out to her mother because she, her mother woke her up every single day of her college career. I was like, first of all, doesn't her mom have anything else to do? I can recommend some books. But does she plan to continue doing that as the student, or as this graduate goes on to having a job, right? And we see this in other ways as well. And I'm not trying to pick on anyone, truly, but I'm just pointing out from our point of view. 
We see students who their parents will call and tell a faculty member they need to retake a test. We see, we've heard of parents, I had another one time, this is a true story, share with me, her son went to school here, he had a great GPA, he was doing really well, but he needed an internship to graduate and he couldn't secure an internship. And so to this day, he still hasn't graduated. When the mother was telling me the story, she said to me, Danny, I just can't figure it out. I don't know why he couldn't get an internship. I called so many places for him. Who in the room does hiring in their jobs? <laughs> if a parent called you to advocate for their student in a professional position, what would you do in response? <laughs> I really appreciated that. It's like gladiator style, like just thumbs down, right? And it's no offense to that student. That student could have been wonderful, but it's a red flag, right? Because you want people who can manage their own lives, who can advocate for themselves. And so all of this goes to that independence and working on it. Um, relying on their peers is another piece. My example here is my little brother, because of course it's fun to pick on my little brother, right? Why wouldn't I? He went to school here for, for a semester, and he made lots of bad decisions. You can probably guess some of them. Some of them were very stereotypical college student bad decisions. He decided to drop out the week before finals. Does anyone want to guess why? He didn't want to take finals, so I'm sure that was some of it, but his, his logic that he gave to our family was, my friend told me I'd get my money back. Good job, good job. That was the right reaction. That you should be laughing or selling or something. Because no, that money is spent. You don't get your money back. And I, and I worked in higher ed at that point, folks. I said to him, I said, Michael, do you think we should have had a conversation about this considering what my profession is? Because I would have told you to at least finish out the semester and then we could reconvene and figure out your next steps, right? Like I would help advise, whatever. Clearly he didn't get his money back. I've heard many other stories like this where a student listened to a friend and didn't take a class that turned out to be a prerequisite, that he ended up needing to add an, an additional full year onto his course schedule because that class wasn't offered again until two years later, right? I hear stories like this all the time. Why am I talking to you about this? Make your student cite their sources. If they come to you with a brand new plan about changing their major, they better have several bullet points to back up why they're going to do that. If they want to study abroad, if they have not mentioned going to the study abroad office and talking to the professionals there waiting to help them do that in their, their career, that's, you stop that conversation. Say, go to the study abroad office. I'll talk to you once you've talked to them, right? Make them connect to the resources that are here and waiting to support them, especially their academic advisors, folks. I would argue they're probably our most underutilized office on campus. <coughs> today, your student will always be able to schedule their courses without any professionals present. It's all online now. It's like putting stuff in a shopping cart on Amazon, right? Like they can do that pretty haphazardly. And if they're not checking in and checking with their academic advisors to make sure they're on course, I am going to wager that your student will not graduate on time. I see it happen all the time. And it's simply because they weren't connecting with the right folks. My, our advice is they touch things digitally, better yet in person with their academic advisor once a semester. And so please hear me when I say that, but your student is going to tend to rely on their peers when there is a vast array of professionals who say, please help, let me help you. I am an expert in my field, right? And so push them that way. But you're also gonna see new types of conflicts for your student. And don't panic, conflict is normal in life. And so I like pointing this out because how many of you don't like someone you work with? <laughs> don't ask if it's your boss or not. I promise your hands are on the computer. We're on the video right, now. right? Plenty of us work with people that we just don't jive with. How many of you don't like one of your neighbors? None of you? My dad complains about the way his neighbor mows his lawn. Right? It's not up to my dad's specifications. I saw a couple of side looks. Maybe that's some things that happen in your house too. Right? You can't go to the mayor of your town and say, my neighbor's annoying me, make them leave. Right? You can't go to your boss and say, look, our personalities just don't work, they've got to go. Conflict is a natural part of life. We want to empower our students to not be afraid of it. Some of this plays out in a roommate space. We know that many of your students are not thinking logically about this. Research shows us this. Does anyone want to guess what the number one fear is related to having a roommate for college students? Just guess it's hard. Not getting along, so that's logical, right? If you don't get along with your roommate, right? They probably are fearing that, but that's probably, or they're probably worried about that, but they're probably not thinking that it's a fear quite yet. 
have their stuff taken. Also sort of logical, and that's actually one of the ones we see the most, is roommates borrowing stuff without asking them. I don't know if borrowing is the right term, but we'll say borrowing, right? Yeah, that is a frequent problem. College students list is their number one fear in, with regard to having a roommate, but their roommate is gonna be naked all the time, <laughs> right? So I wanna be very clear here, folks. I can't promise that won't happen. But I can say, in my professional career, I've never heard of that happening, right? We do see sometimes students get to college and think, I want to be free in all the ways, right? So it might play out that way. The number two fear might be that they're going to have a stinky roommate, that the roommate doesn't shower enough or doesn't clean enough. And I wasn't kidding when I say, Ari, sometimes you're like, sheet washing party this weekend, everybody washes their sheets. Because some students don't think they need to do that more than once a semester. Right? We do absolutely hear stories of students taking to-go containers from our dining hall into the residence halls and letting them pile up for weeks. And then they'll go to the housing office and say, why are there bugs in my room? And we say, well, there's some reasons for that. Actions have consequences, or inaction has consequences, right? But we, that's what they're thinking about. They're also probably hoping that their roommate becomes their best friend. And that's not necessarily realistic either. What we try to do is reset expectations that about a living environment is about respect and it's about advocating for your needs. And so sometimes that plays out of, you have to have conversations about when it's lights out or when it's TV off or when it's music out or when you need to wear headphones or here are the rules for when you want to borrow my stuff. Or hey, you have to lock the door when you leave because my stuff is in there too. We hear lots of reports of one roommate not wanting to lock the door because they simply don't like carrying their keys, right? So those are things that we see. We have lots of folks trained to help your student navigate through conflict management, but I will promise you that on the first day of classes, we will absolutely have a student come and ask to have their roommate moved. It's usually not to move themselves. It's usually, can you move my roommate, right? And we will say no if it's not an egregious problem because we need them to at least try. And we, it's usually about two weeks that we require them to kind of figure it out. And then we do what we can. That's for the on-campus living at least. We also see friends have conflict and there be a learning process there. And this is important because by a show of hands, how many of you have walked away from a toxic relationship at some point in your life? Regardless of what type of relationship, right? Right? But you probably had this moment where you were like, my goodness, this person is not good for me. This person brings me down. This person isn't encouraging. This person is very manipulative, etc. I had that happen to me my senior year of college. It was like truly like someone turned on the light bulb for me. And all of a sudden it was very clear in front of me who this person was that I thought was my friend. Right? And that was a good thing in, my, in the span of my life that I had the courage to say, you know what, I can wish that person well, but it's time for me to move on. And so we want that for your student as well. Your student likely will pick friends in the first couple of weeks of school that they simply see often. They aren't necessarily going to pick people that jive with their motivation levels, that connect with their values, that connect with their interests. Now, we have tricks that aren't really tricks, they're kind of obvious. Join clubs that you're interested in. You will meet people who have the same interests as you. That's how you make friends, right? Develop common experiences. We also have lots of conversations with students about this concept. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I would argue that that's true for you all as well. Again, students are humans. Humans have very similar characteristics. And what we want our students to do is think about what their life plans are. Not necessarily what the on paper goals are, but what, what do they want to feel good about? How do they want to spend their time? What do they want their friendship quality times to look like? Why am I telling you this? Because you can check your student without necessarily making it obvious. You can say things to your student like, tell me about your friends. How do they spend their time? Are they in clubs? How often do they study? I will bet folks their answers about their friends will be very parallel to what their true answers are about themselves. So if your student is friends with people who gain 12 hours a day, which is a thing, right? Any student, any folks have gamers, their students, yeah. Very, very normal, like that is, that is the culture we live in today. A lot of students consider them gamers. Full disclosure, I don't really get it. I like Mario Kart and Tetris, right? But I try to be supportive of learning that, that culture. But I will tell you, in this building, there are students who are in this building more than I am, right? And I get confused about it because I feel like sometimes I see them in the same shirt for a few days in a row because they haven't left, because they sustain themselves on quick snacks from a convenience store because they're gaming with people in different time zones, right? It's actually really cool as long as they aren't learned to manage it. And so if your student is saying that, then we want them to understand, hey, is this meeting what your priorities are? You understand you could have continued gaming without paying tuition, right? Or change, change gaming for Netflix binges or for parties or for whatever it is. 
Conversely, right, if your student is friends with students with other students who show up on time for class, who, you know, shower before they go to class, right, who sit in the front row, right, that might be reflective of where your student is at. Iron sharpens iron, folks. If you don't believe me, Google famous roommates, right? And I wholeheartedly believe it's because they push each other. If you see another person achieving, you want a taste of that too. And so your students' friends will matter. All of this leads to confidence building, which is crucial. What's happening with your family? You may find, even if this isn't your first student, right? You know as well as I do that every one of your students are different. My right? two children are 20 months apart, and it's fascinating how different they are, right? But, but even if you already have a student in college, you might find that your relationship is about to be redefined as a family. That your dynamics might change, and that might, might not be a bad thing. It might be a little bit of a scary thing, but that's okay. You might need to relinquish unnecessary control. Folks, I've had people tell me that they expect hourly phone calls after class. Like, if your class is done, I want you to check in with me. I don't know your student. I don't know their unique needs. So please understand I'm not trying to be condescending or insulting. But if that's where your thoughts are, you really need to have some conversations with your students about that today. Because my guess is they have different expectations, right? And one of the things that comes with this is understanding the perspective, I'll say it that way. You know, 20, 30 years ago, college students would call their families once a week from the payphone down the hall. Did anyone have a standing appointment to call their families like that? The bosses in the back saying, yeah. When did you call, Sean? Sunday nights. Sunday nights, right. Your family expects you to call. I think you told me this story before. You would call, collect, and then hang up, and then call you back. And... Right. right, so good, you're economic. <laughs> right, so that's how it used to be, that once a week phone call. Folks, when I tell you, many of you might even get Snapchats or pictures of their tests as they're being handed back out. And why is this important? Because sometimes it's going, your student is going to think the sky is falling, when in fact it's not. 30 years ago, they probably would have forgotten about that by Sunday, because a lot of other life would have taken place. Our advice here is this. Move like your feet are stuck in concrete. If your student calls you, you know, just start in a situation, right? You know when it's a real, real problem, right? But if they call you and they, they just need to cry about something, great. Then say, okay, how are you going to fix it, right? Don't let them dwell on those, those what they feel like crisis moments. If your student texts you because they forget their bank account login, let that marinate, right? How often do they let your text marinate? <laughs> Right? Don't act like, don't respond as if everything is an emergency because I promise in those margins they will start figuring some of this out. Right? In the event that your student is really struggling, and you'll know, if you are really not sure how to coach them, how to support them, what resources to send them to, please call us. Absolutely. <laughs> we want to understand and help and to help support your student. But we likely will end that phone call with that now tell your student to come see us. Right? Because we understand that while you've been their biggest advocate to this point, this is where the shift starts taking place into more of a coaching role. Um, again, that's encouraging responsibility, encourage problem solving. I kind of already alluded to this, but life doesn't come with an instruction manual. Problem solving is crucial for your student to be successful beyond college. Another myth I would love your help in dispelling is that college is not this pause before the real world. College is very much the real world. Actions matter, decisions matter. And I, you know, there's a ripple effect to everything. And so that problem solving is crucial for their later, for their later responsibilities in life. What are our expectations for your student? One, understand and meet ex academic expectations. Just so you know, the entire academic map for your student's major is already online. They can download it in PDF form and follow it. If they were like me, they can color code it, right? And cross it out and figure things out. They can do that. They still should be talking to their academic advisor because students still miss things sometimes. We don't understand they can, they can switch out classes in very unique circumstances and academic advisors do know that, but we want to help them through that process. We want them to help learn time and priority management. Folks, and this is where I get a little snarky sometimes. Students tell me all the time how busy they are. And I know that, but sometimes I sit in my wonderful lofty tower from 20,000 feet with, oh, wait till after college, right? <laughs> right till life changes even more. I thought I was stressed in college. Life after college has been much more stressful. And I also say things like this. You understand Google didn't always exist, right? How many of you went to college before Google or before a computer in your room, right? Did any of you still have to handwrite papers? Yeah, and you didn't have a red squiggly line that appeared when you spelled something wrong. By all reasoning, college should be easier today than it used to be, right? Now, I understand there's other psychological things. There's a 
so much choice that it's overwhelming and we have a paralysis of decisions. There's lots of other pieces that come into play. But I do try to say things like that to them, just kind of have them give this moment of, wait, why do I feel so busy? When I tell you we literally do workshops with students where we print them out a weekly hourly schedule, give them red and say color in when you're supposed to be in class. Now take blue, fill in when you're supposed to be sleeping, greens for eating and showering, right? Now, where is your free time? Because my guess is for most of our students, they are way too distracted by screens. And I will tell you folks, that is my biggest challenge is competing with screens to convince your student to show up. That is the hardest part of my job. Second hardest is to get them to read email. It's amazing, right? They'll say, email me, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Then they'll say, oh yeah, I don't check my email. Like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> like, where do I go from there, right? And so time and priority management, your student should be checking their Penn State email at least once a day, at least once a day. That is our primary means of communicating with them. We want students to learn the value of higher education before you panic and think, wait a minute, my student's not gonna get a job. That's not what we're saying. We absolutely, absolutely want to help your student have gainful employment when they leave here. But you know as well as I do, there is significant national conversation about why are there so many overeducated, underemployed folks? I can't say this 100%, but I would absolutely bet that if you showed me each of those people's resumes, I could point out very quickly that they didn't understand what they signed up for when they went to college. What do I mean by that? College is about the whole environment. They should be learning and looking for opportunities at every turn. We hear the adage, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I will absolutely argue it's first what you know, then it's who you know, right? Like you have to know some things, absolutely. But you do need to network. You do need to have skill sets. Those of you who do hiring, have you ever seen a really fluffed up resume and you do it immediately as soon as you interviewed that candidate, right? You have have students who say, why well, is the president of a club? I'm like, yeah, but you didn't do anything, right? Yeah, you do in fact hold that tail, but you aren't going to be able to back that up with a skilled interviewer. Right? We have career services who will help them learn to be interviewed because we tell people to be humble and not brag. And then we put them into, um, into interviewing rooms where we say, now brag about yourself. Now prove to us that you are ready for this job. And that can be very hard for a lot of folks. I interview people quite a bit and often I find that they are underselling themselves when their resumes look great. Right? Or I'll see things like, I have a great attention to detail and the next sentence has a typo in it. Like, That's not true. Right? And so why am I talking about all of this? Because the value of higher education is all that we offer. It is not an expense, it is an investment. And if they show up, if they opt in, I promise they will see the dividends after they are gone. Even more than that, for our global society, we want people who are critical thinkers. We want people who are problem solvers. We want people who can understand how to pivot as the world changes. Right? Whoever thought we'd have robots in hospitals taking care of patients already? I mean, I know like Star Wars folks did, but like truly, right? Like even 10 years ago, that was still seemed so far off. Folks, 10 years from now, there will be jobs we're not even thinking of today. The United States was ahead of the computer science revolution, not because we had computer science majors. We have folks skilled in logic and philosophy who are creative, who have the guts to imagine and, vision, and have vision, right? That's what we want of our students. And if that means they're also really great accountants while we're at it, awesome, and we have met our goals. We want them to know about resources and engage with faculty. Every single semester that I have worked here, I have told one student I would be a reference for them, at least. And that's not an easy conversation for me to have, because I like helping people, but sometimes I just don't know them well enough to vouch for them. Faculty see this as a lot as well. Have you been bragged to about today? Our low faculty to student ratios. Yes, thank you, I don't do that. Right, our biggest classroom on campus is 100 students. So it's 100 students, right? Your students should know at least one faculty member by name, like that faculty should recognize them by name. I stand before you of what they stand, as a representation of what they stand to gain. My academic advisor paid attention to me and said, Danny, have you ever thought about student affairs as a profession? I promise you, I responded with the phrase, what's that? I didn't even know this was a career field. And if it's not obvious, I like my job. I am fulfilled by the work that I do. I enjoy coming to work each day. That's what we want for your students as well. And our, our faculty, be, faculty can be great conduits for that. We will sing from the rooftops for the students that we really want to endorse. In fact, I just gave a reference the other day for a student that I started out saying, I know you have questions for me, but I couldn't possibly recommend this candidate further. And then I was able to back it up with stories, right? I could tell them about this person's character and about their work ethic. That's what we want for them. We want to expand their knowledge of human 
diversity. Again, we've already talked about this a little bit, but would you agree that our world has some big challenges today? And always will. Even if we solve the ones for today, there will be new ones that pop up. We want students to understand the value of sitting at a table with different perspectives. And are any of you fans of President Lincoln in the history buffs in the room? My undergrad is history. I promise I won't go on a soapbox about why President Lincoln was cool. I could, but I won't. Did any of you watch the movie uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis? So thank you. Yeah. So that movie was based on a book called Team of Rivals. And if you're curious, I recommend reading it. It's really interesting. But in that book, it talks about how Lincoln, when he was um, elected president, he filled his cabinet with folks that had beaten him in other elections. And when asked why, he said, I already know how I think. I need to know how other people think as well. Folks, the wisdom in that statement, I really wish we could keep seeing that play out in our federal government, right? That we all, we don't necessarily need an echo chamber sending back to us what we already know and believe. We need to understand the diversity in this world and that problems sometimes need creative solutions. We want them to understand personal wellness, right? How many of you have already discovered ways to keep yourself well? When you're stressed, you have some healthy mechanisms to cope. Good, what are those? Working out, yeah, how many of you working out is your answer? Yeah, that seems to be actually the most, like, the, I guess the most common one today, which makes sense. That's good for your body. It releases healthy endorphin, or hormones for your brain, all those things. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, we see students who use some unhealthy means of coping. Any guesses as to what those are? Drinking, Drinking drugs, sleeping, right? Avoiding <laughs> their problems, right? Sleeping was mine. What we want your student to do is explore to figure out what works for them. For some of your students, it might be yoga. For other students, it's jujitsu because they want to hit something in a healthy environment, right? No judgment, right? For other students, it's hiking. For other students, it's petting puppies. How many of you know if your students going to be a petting puppies person? We literally bring dogs to campus a couple of times a semester because we know that reduces stress in our students. We also know that homesickness, when they report that, the first thing we'll talk about is their dog movements. Right? They miss their, or their cat, but mostly dogs is what we hear first. And so we want them to figure out how they can be personally well, because they can't be academically successful if their mind and their body aren't in sync and if they're not doing well themselves. We want them to define short and long-term goals. Again, life is not linear. If they have big, lofty goals, that's great. What steps can they be taking today and this week and this semester to get there? And we want your student to get involved. Simply put, if your student is bored here, it is their fault. Right? And you can tell them, say, Danny said, right? That is their fault. Our events calendar is live, it's online, it, we have apps for it, they, there's always something to do. If I don't offer things that they like, they need to come see me, because at the end of the day, I am spending their money, right? They are simply paying too much money to come here if they aren't engaging in these out-of-classroom things. To be clear, I don't spend a dime without student permission. There's a team of students who say, yes, that's a good idea, and they get to decide how we spend money. It's called the student activity fee. I'm supposed to run out at the end of each year, but I'm not supposed to save that money because it's supposed to be spent on the students who pay into that pot. And so there is plenty of things to do. We average about six events out of the classroom per day. It does not include athletics. It doesn't include faculty-initiated programming. And so to be clear, I don't mean confetti rains from the ceiling six times a day. That would be a lot of confetti. Right? It's probably not that great for the environment. But that could be a meeting to plan a trip to go visit a law school for students who are interested in being lawyers. That might mean, you know, um, a debate club meeting where they sit and talk about where the next event, or maybe it's a political meeting where they're going to canvas the community. Or maybe it is, in fact, I put a hamster looking ball thing over their heads and tell them to play soccer, which then turns into American gladiators. But either way, healthy stress managing mechanisms, right? And so we do those things to try to give them space to have alternatives to some of those unhealthy things. So we also want them to be learning in that space. I'm very quickly going to pivot to Penn State University Police Department. I'm not a member of the police department, but I recognize that you are thinking about your student's safety. Is that a fair statement? Cool. Okay, so to be very clear, they are, they are full-fledged police officers. If you're from Pennsylvania, the Act is Act 120 certifications. So students will sometimes come and say, oh, they're running cops, you know, they say those derogatory things. No, they are full-blown police officers with full arresting powers in the state of Pennsylvania. They do work with three other police departments because campus is unique and that there's a municipal line that runs through campus. There are literally spots on campus where if I'm standing here, I'm in Altoona City. If I'm here, I am in Logan Township, right? And so we work really closely with those departments and then, of course, the state police. We do offer services because we are a small society here on campus, so we can do that. Walk 
walking escorts, if your student, let's say they're studying in Hawthorne late at night at the library, and they're feeling a little anxious about walking to their, their residence hall, they can call and when the police are available, they will come take them back. To be clear, that doesn't mean they can call for Martin's with a cart full of groceries, right? You say they aren't feeling safe. That's actually happened, right? Here's the number for Uber, right? But they will offer those services if a student feels that they need that. We have vehicle lockout and jumpstart services because in Pennsylvania, things get cold, batteries die, we will jump their vehicles. Uh, we have emergency phones on campus that send notifications to 911 with GPS coordinates that will send the nearest police officer to help your student. Um, vehicle parking registration is through that, through the university police office. And we also do weapons storage if any of your students are hunters. We have aliens all over the place. They can't have those, those weapons in their vehicles on campus or in their residence halls on campus, obviously. So if you have questions about those, I'd encourage you to call Penn State University Police. Um, the number's there, but everything I'm saying today is Googleable about our services. So after today, because you're like, Danny, I can't see that phone number. Simply Google Penn State Altoona Police. It'll be right there. Everything, as long as you put Penn State Altoona in it, you are going to find the link you need, or at least get close enough to call. We do have emergency testing services, and I'm telling you about this because students don't always think this is necessary to sign up for. And so if your student uses their access account, which is their email address, so that's that, they're likely their initials followed by some numbers, that access account does just that. It gives them access to Penn State intranets. And so their access account will go in and sign up for their cell phone number. They can also add one additional number. How many of you are going to buy for that one additional number spot, right? Yeah, absolutely. And folks, I work here and my husband has signed up for them, right? Just because that makes sense in today's world that we should have you know, emergency communications in place. And so they can also sign up for any Penn State campus they intend to spend time at. So how many of your students, let's say, have season tickets to one of our athletic programs at University Park? Right. So if they're going to be there for football weekends, they should sign up for University Park as well as Altoona. Okay, maybe they have a significant other or a best friend at another Penn State campus and they'll be visiting them sometimes. Sign up for those texts as well, right? If your student thinks they don't need this, tell them this is how we tell them about school cancellations or two hour delays. And they're like, oh yeah, I want that. I want to know that before I get out of bed. That usually helps the numbers go up quickly, but I think that's a cool service we offer. I also want to point out a little bit about alcohol and drugs very, very quickly. Of course, most of our behavior problems are connected to alcohol. We do have conversations with your student about choices, about safety, trying to make sure that they are empowered to make healthy decisions. Social norming has showed us that our students who choose to drink, the majority of them do so responsibly, not saying legally. I'm saying responsibly, right? They're not going out by themselves, they're going with friends, they're not drinking to the point of being sick or blacking out, they're not driving, those types of things. But Pennsylvania is one of the strictest states in the nation when it comes to enforcement about this. If you live in Pennsylvania, this is normal. If you don't, this might be notable for you to have a conversation with your student. For example, a DUI in Pennsylvania, if you were underage, a 0 0.02 blood alcohol content is enough to get you a DUI. For most of your students, that's a beer. And so they should not be driving under any circumstances if they are underage. And so um, I also want to point out that marijuana is still illegal in Pennsylvania recreationally, of course. Um, federally, it's still illegal, period. So if your student has as a medical marijuana prescription that they and that is now legal in Pennsylvania, they cannot have it in their residence halls because we are still bound as a uh, university by federal legislation. Here's a great example of civic engagement because I've had some parents kind of challenge me a little bit. Folks, I have no power over that rule. The federal government does. So if you would like to call someone, please, I encourage you to do so if you feel strongly one way or the other. But if your student lives in the residence halls, I'd encourage you not to leave today without talking to the housing office because that's going to be an issue that needs to be navigated they can't have that, that prescription in the halls. I also want to quickly point out the Good Samaritan Law because we truly believe the Good Samaritan Law can save lives and we believe it has saved lives. So the Good Samaritan Law is a law in Pennsylvania that gives medical amnesty to your student if they in fact call to help another student. So let me explain the steps that are necessary. Let's say I'm underage and I'm at a party and I look over and my friend is passed out and that person um, Clearly needs medical attention. One of our educational efforts are teaching students that passing out does mean they need medical attention. There is a prevailing understanding with students, unfortunately, that if you're passed out, you just need to sleep it off. And as long as they don't roll on their back, everything will be okay. Right? That part somehow landed somewhere, but the passing out part didn't. So we we're trying to teach students that if a student is passed out, they need medical attention. But so I see this person needs medical attention, but here I am. I am nervous to call because I too am underage and I am drunk or, or or under whatever influence of whatever substance. The law says that if I call and I'm the first person to call 911, 
I identify myself by my real name. I stay in the space with the person that needs the attention. I stay on the phone with 911, but I will receive amnesty under the law. Penn State will back that up with something called the Responsible Action Protocol. To be clear, it doesn't mean a conversation won't be had with, with the appropriate people at Penn State, but it does mean there's amnesty there. Okay, now I also want to point out students are, are clever. I've had students say to me, Danny, what if I call with 12 of my closest friends? Do we always receive amnesty? No. <laughs> Danny, what if my friend wants to stay with me so I'm not alone while I wait for the first responders to arrive? That friend doesn't receive amnesty either. And we see that that sometimes becomes confusion that students then don't trust this law. And so we're really trying to say, it's just about the first person who calls. Please hear me when I say, I will absolutely say in front of rooms full of students just like this one, that if you are in a situation and a student needs medical attention and the folks in the room are giving you kind of pushback about calling, and I have heard stories from students themselves that this happened to them, tell them to leave that you were calling anyway. Bottom line, folks, we want that person getting the medical attention they need. The Good Samaritan Law represents this idea of bystander intervention. How many of you have watched John Quixote says, what would you do? Do you remember that show? I don't think it's on anymore, but it's on YouTube. So John Quixote just capitalized on human behavior and that we have this habit of second guessing ourselves. And maybe, and you don't have to raise your hand, but maybe you've been in scenarios that your gut told you something was wrong, but then you left, you left it alone because you didn't want to interfere, that you assumed you didn't understand the situation well enough. So let me give you this scenario. Let's say again, I'm at a party and I look over and person A is clearly being aggressive to person B. Their body language is telling me that something just feels off, right? You know that gut feeling, that just something's wrong. My human nature is going to say, Danny, they could be siblings. Danny, maybe they're having a fight and that person, that person doesn't like that they're being called out for something they did, right? But all the while, my gut is still saying, this just feels off. So by state intervention, our program is called Stand for State, teaches students to feel empowered and to have tools to intervene. So in that scenario, I could walk up to person B and say, come here, I want you to meet my friend over here. And I just kind of very intentionally pull that person away from person A without ever having assaulted person A's character, right? I've made no verbal judgments to that person. I haven't put myself in danger. I have been blissfully unaware of whatever was happening, but I got the person out of the scenario. I hear stories about groups of students who have code words, that if one of them uses a code word when they are out, but that means to everybody, something feels off. We're going to leave now. I've heard stories of students spilling something on themselves or other students just as for an excuse to leave, right? That's cool, folks. They are taking safety seriously and we are taking, they are realizing they are empowered. And while I hate the statement that's about to come out of my mouth, it's the truth. I can't promise you that every student will be safe here, right? I can't promise that my children will be safe here. Like the world is, there's too many things to happen. But you know what I think truly deep down in my core? I believe that if we empower your students to have the courage to act when something feels off, we truly can change this world, right? And I know this because students know things about each other that I can't know as an administrator. I have had students report to me that they finally got the courage to come forward and say, I have a friend who is in a very, very um, abusive dating relationship. In one particular scenario, I knew both students in the relationship. Folks never would have guessed, never would have guessed. It was absolutely true because after it came out, there were other students who came forward and said, oh yeah, we all knew about that. But thankfully that one person intervened, right? And so students know when their friends are struggling with substances. Students know when their friends are in bad relationships. Students know when their friends are sleeping and not getting out of bed each day right? We might just think they're skipping class. And so we want our students to be empowered to act. So that's our Stand for State program. Switching quickly to tips for college parenting and more on a light note, it's okay. However you feel is how you feel. We have seen it all folks from people who don't let go of their children at move-in day, right? You just start kind of crying back fingers, right? How many of you know that's going to be you, right? I think you should form a support group that day. If you're crying, hug each other, right? Like let your student walk on and then you can hug each other, right? We have also absolutely see seen families roll up drop the Rubbermaid containers on the, cur the curb and leave and head to the airport for their much needed vacation, right? No judgment. Please try to hold out for junior year. I wish I could say I have a magical Harry Potter portal, but they walk through and all of a sudden become college students. Nope. Their first year of college, they are high school students in a new geographic setting. That's just the simple truth of it. Junior year is when we really see all of this culminate and come together to help your student be confident, 
have the life experiences, have the life management, have a little bit more clarity about what it is that they want. My boss, his son just graduated last year, um, or in the spring. And if he was standing before you with his 33 years of Penn State student affairs experience, he will tell you that he needed to wait for junior year for his son, right? This is just part of the life transformation process. If you can, don't change their room. That's a security blanket for them. If they're living away from you, that security blanket can provide them some calm in the midst of all this change, right? Sorry for those of you who are planning on like your yoga room or scrapbooking room, I'm sorry. If you can hold off, please do, right? And just be patient with them. So one of the things I also want to point out, so a lot of this presentation is about the potential bumps your student might have to have. I don't know which bump your student is going to have, but I promise there will be at least one. Please don't panic. This all lends to this growth that goes so well for your student. We are here to connect, to support. We want to build relationships with your student. We want to help them get to that successful transformation, and we know it can happen. I have so many students that I, one of my favorite parts of my job is reflecting on a student as they walk across the graduation stage compared to who they were their first year, right? There is a different level of confidence and autonomy and assurance in who they are as people. And it doesn't mean they're done yet. It just means they're ready to take the next step. And I really believe that your student can do that as well. Just please just help us help them and have them access our resources. Folks, is that fair? Yeah? Did this make you think a little bit? Today. Just a little differently. I know you still want to see that academic schedule. I promise you will soon, right? I know that that's still a thing. But I just want to start kind of changing the mindset a little bit about what it means for your student. After today, I look forward to seeing you all, regardless of where your student lives, on Friday, August 23rd. So that day represents the beginning of Welcome Week. That weekend, so Friday and Saturday, when I tell you shock and awe, folks, your student could be busy nonstop for two solid days. That's intentional, kind of like summer camp. We want them to not think about being homesick. We want them not to regret their decisions to come because they haven't even tried yet, right? We have students every year this weekend who think they shouldn't be here. I have, I have conversations with students about, can you just try the first week, right? Just try to stick it out for the first week, baby steps, right? But this weekend is designed and led by other peers, their peers called orientation leaders who have been in their shoes before. And those students will help them navigate the first few weeks. And this is the best time to do it. Why? because everybody around them is just as uncomfortable and unsure as they are. Okay, so it doesn't matter how great they were in, in uh, high school, they likely are nervous about what this experience is. Maybe they're not today, but that day they likely will be. And so we have a great group of students ready to support them through that transition. We also know that from national data shows that students who participate in this weekend are more likely to have a successful first semester of college and are more likely to graduate. Conversely, students who don't participate in this weekend tend to struggle more because they don't know about the resources, they don't feel connected to their peers, they don't feel part of the campus community, and they don't get a redo, folks. This is only offered before their first semester starts. After that, they need to start advocating for themselves beyond that weekend. So please help me get your students here. The truth is what I think happens is many students come and they see this great schedule of events and they think they sound interesting, but they decide to stay in their room. Right? But that's truly what I think is happening more and more because the fact of the matter is if your student doesn't come, they can still graduate. And so students hear that and think, well, then I don't need to come, not thinking about the potential benefits that await them to come. So can you please help me get your student to come this weekend? Not, to, not this weekend, August week or that weekend. It's the weekend before classes start. Well, great. So our time here is done today. I hope you do not feel like I wasted your time. I hope it is evident that we are excited to see your student, to connect with them, to support them. I will stay up here for about the next 10 minutes. You have a break until 11 a.m. You will ask that you're back in your seats by 11 for the next piece, which is a lot of the business end of being a student. Um, if I have a have a more one-on-one uh, -on -one question that you would like to ask, you're also welcome to take, take a gander, I'll say, through the room behind us and check out the resources on those tables. But that room will also be open 12.30 to 1.30 as well if you don't have time to do that now. Folks, thank you so much for your attention today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.